Okay. Hello, if everyone will take your seats. I think we'll begin. Good evening and welcome to the inaugural lecture of Dr. Crystal Downing. This would be a good time to silence your cell phones or your comfort animals or whatever you have that might make noise. Um, I'm distinctly, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Crystal Downing. Um, my best way that I like to sum her up is she blends the love of wisdom with the wisdom of love. Uh, <laughs> Crystal graduated from Westmont College. She was a beach recreation major, uh, English major, English major. Uh, she, went to, she received her master's and her PhD from UC Santa Barbara. She taught as a visiting professor at UC Santa Barbara, at UCLA, and at Messiah College, and received distinguished teaching awards at all three institutions. Uh, she was last at Messiah College. She was the distinguished professor of English and film studies. She's published four books on sin, cinema, semiotics, and sayers. Uh, so she does a lot of cultural work. She knows a lot about postmodern theory and really invites you to engage with continental theorists rather than just dismiss them. She's also published over 100 articles. Uh, and so she's quite expert on blending sayers with film, but also with semiotics. She's very good at interdisciplinary work. So I'm happy to introduce her. Uh, the Victorian poet Robert Browning was often not as well known as his wife Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who wrote sonnets from the Portuguese. And so at social occasions, he was sometimes introduced as Mrs. Browning's husband. And I would just like to say, it would be my honor to be remembered by posterity as Mrs. Downing's husband. <laughs> so. Wow, that's a hard act to follow. <clears throat> I am honored and humbled to be here tonight as the co-holder co of the Wade Chair of Christian Thought. And I wanna talk tonight about how cinema has helped me promote Christian thought and how the Wade has contributed to that promotion. But before I do so, I want to um, <clears throat> invite you to a, an entirely different talk that will be held here at Wheaton that is sponsored by the Wheaton Feminist Club, where I will be talking about how Dorothy Sayers can help us negotiate the Me Too movement and the problems of women in Hollywood. And this is one of Sayers famous texts, Are Women Human? Her answer was yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Tonight, I want to emphasize the importance of cinema to Sayer's Christian thought. I believe that Christians need to be more intentional about the study of film. Fewer and fewer people today are feeding their imaginations through books. Cinema has become the lingua franca of narrative fiction, especially among younger generations. So we need to take it seriously. How can cinema contribute to Christian thought? I find it ironic that I have heard at least a hundred times in the various conferences I have gone to, people reporting C.S. Lewis's comment about George MacDonald's Fantasties, that it baptized his imagination. But I've heard no one quote another important statement from C.S. Lewis's introduction to Fantasties, and this is it. What really delights and nourishes me, says Lewis, is a particular pattern of events in Fantasties, which would equally delight and nourish if it had reached me by some medium which involved no words at all, like a mime or silent film. 
So he is seeing the power of George MacDonald as a visual, dreamlike power, rather than the power of words themselves. So notice Lewis uses that word medium, and that is part of what I see as a Christian response to film, that the medium is the message, and I'll get more into that later. The Wages of Cinema, which is my title tonight, was actually the working title of my most recent book, and I have a poster here that I wanted to show you because I moved it all the way from Pennsylvania here, so there has to be a reason, but this will come up into my, in my talk later on. Uh, as I was doing research for this book, I had to change focus. My original intent was to write a book that encouraged Christians to value the artistry of the film medium because almost every single evangelical book I read, and I probably read about 30, that um, dealt with cinema had reduced film to a content delivery system. As this shot of uh, the famous Charlie Chaplin from what many scholars consider his best film um, communicates a lot of people actually turn their backs on the screen only to think of the ideas that are being delivered. And I found that many scholars weren't saying anything about film that you couldn't have gleaned just by reading the screenplay. But the screenplay isn't the film. It's ignoring the medium. <clears throat> One well-known book had a chapter titled, In Film, Story is Everything, which simply isn't true and would um, anger a lot of film scholars. I discovered that theologians who would disdain a book about Christian dogma that didn't pay any attention to the historical development of the dogma at the ecumenical councils will nevertheless write books on film where they never consider the historical development of film or of film theory. And people who would dismiss a book about the gospel message that never uses the words incarnation or atonement, nevertheless write about film never using the basic wor words of film theory, which are mise-en-scene and montage. Now, cinema began as a commercial enterprise in the United States. It really established artistic value in France. And so these two terms come from the French. Mise en scène is everything that you see on the screen in any one shot. So it's how the camera catches elements on the screen. Montage is the French word for assemblage. So montage is, even to this day, if you watch a French film, the credits will say montage, which just means editing. It's how you cut together the various shots. <coughs> so as I did research for my book in order to challenge these various oversights by Christians as they talked about film, I discovered that scholars of other religions were doing the exact same thing. And so I have show and tell. Film is about the power of seeing. So I have a lot of things for you to look at. And it was like scholars would come to a film and they go, oh, here's a Buddhist insight. Oh, here's a Muslim insight. Oh, here's a Hindu insight. Oh, here's a Jewish insight. Here is a Christian insight. But they were never looking at the shape of the film, the weave of the film, the color, how it was put together. And so they weren't really seeing. Isn't it fascinating that in Genesis 1, when God is creating, the Hebrew word um, saw is used at least six or seven times. Um, God created and saw that it was good. 
God saw that it was good. It's not God declared that it was good. God saw, and it is the basic Hebrew word for that. People just weren't seeing the value of creation. Okay, so then I realized I have to acknowledge this is a problem among multiple religions of not seeing the medium itself. So I changed the title of my book in order to acknowledge these oversights among scholars in other religions. And I knew in other religions they wouldn't get the pun, the wages of cinema. So I thought, oh, I'll save that for some other time. <laughs> so I changed it to salvation from cinema because people from all religions have this double response to film. They want salvation from cinema. Either they want to be saved from the decadence of cinema, right? And they um, dismiss it, or they want salvation messages from cinema. Well, uh, as a result, when Rutledge offered me a contract for the book, they wanted me to focus on this broader topic of religion and film so that they could market the book as a text for university classrooms, at secular university classrooms. <coughs> this meant that they wanted me to treat, treat Christianity as one religion among many, which discouraged me at first until I realized, well, God can work in mysterious ways. Here was an opportunity for me to steal past watchful dragons, as C.S. Lewis famously put it, um, in, a, in order to communicate the gospel message, especially the, communicate the fact that Christianity transcends all other religions without people realizing that I was doing it. Um, I call it guerrilla evangelism. <laughs> so what I did is invoke a famous Jewish atheist to argue for the truth of Christianity. I'm sure some of you have heard of Jacques Derrida. He's the famous godfather of deconstruction. And I talk about the fact, in fact, I added a whole chapter on Derrida to be able to do this, that he coined the word exchangeism to establish how all societies work. Uh, I do this, you give me that in exchange. And that is, it's so fundamental to being human. Even our language is based on exchange of, I exchange this word for an idea, that exchangeism influences all religions. And here is how I put it. I am going to use my pince nez that reminds me of Dorothy Sayers. I don't know how these people wore these. I can only stand it for so long. Um, but they don't even work that well. OK. So here, many religions inculcate, if even unwittingly, some form of exchangeism. Do these works, you receive salvation. Perform this right, you become redeemed. Behave this way, you attain paradise. Believe this doctrine, you escape damnation. Follow these principles, you achieve nirvana. Kill these infidels, you enjoy the pleasures of heaven. Interestingly, <clears throat> Derrida acknowledges what he calls this economy of exchange and says the only thing that avoids it is love offered as a pure gift, not because of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, he doesn't use that phrase, not because of works, lest anyone should boast, but that's essentially what he is saying. So, um, I, oh, I have to show you one little tidbit as I was researching this. This movie, famous Charlie Chaplin movie, is a movie about love where the tramp um, takes in this little homeless kid 
who is played by the actor Jackie Coogan. I found out that Jacques Derrida, the famous father of deconstruction, was named after this kid, uh -huh. Jackie Coogan. Uh -huh. So he went through most of his life being called Jackie Derrida, but once he got a PhD in philosophy at the Sorbonne and was going to teach, you know, hey, Mr. Jackie, so he changed his name to Jacques Derrida. Okay. When he is then explaining what a gift of pure love might look like in contradistinction to an economy of exchange, he gives the example of Jesus Christ, this Jewish atheist philosopher. He quotes the Bible. So I don't quote the Bible. I quote Jacques Derrida quoting the Bible. <laughs> it was great. I stole past those watchful dragons. And then I was able to hope that my readers would remember how I explained earlier on in the text the basic doctrines of Christianity. <sighs> and I was able to do it <laughs> by um, saying that it's ironic that Christians aren't honoring these doctrines when it comes to film. So I think that worked too, because I'm kind of criticizing Christians. But of course, this is one of my concerns. Failure to engage with and assess the visual medium is especially ironic for Christians. Doctrine hammered out in the first five centuries of the church emphasized, emphasizes that. Uh, salvation is mediated not through stories and insights spoken by Jesus, but through his material body hung upon the cross, a medium that was seen after the resurrection. During the Third Ecumenical Council, the church leaders therefore borrowed a Greek philosophical term, hypostasis, meaning underlying substance, to argue that Christ's human nature cannot be separated from his divine nature. It is a hypostatic union. Inspired by this ancient doctrine of Christianity confirmed at Chalcedon, salvation from cinema argues for a hypostatic union of medium and message in film scholarship. So the cool thing is, oh, this made my nose itch. So <clears throat> this is being read in classrooms at secular universities. Hallelujah. But I was still left with my original project on my hands. How to challenge Christians to value the medium of film. This then is where Dorothy Sayers comes in. First of all, she taught me about docetism, which is an early Christian heresy that says Christ only seemed to be flesh. It was like God in, in disguise. And the reason she brought it up is that she argued that Christians were docetic when it comes to the arts. They ignore the material medium. This, of course, is, um, applies to film when Christians focus only on the divine ideas that a film delivers, like pulling them out of the basket. Second, I discovered numerous references to cinema in Sayre's unpublished letters. So I realized that then she might be able to help me emphasize the hypostatic union of medium and message in cinema. As she put it, Christian work is good work well done. It is not work that simply delivers the greatest number of greatest ideas, as John Ruskin once put it. And furthermore, I believe that cinema led her to this conclusion. Unfortunately, Sayre's interest in film has been misrepresented, if not entirely ignored altogether by her biographers. The great uh, dame of Sayre's studies, <laughs> the brilliant Barbara Reynolds, to whom I owe immeasurable thanks. I mean, this was a brilliant, brilliant woman. These are her collected letters of 
um, published letters of Sayers, about 2,000 pages worth, but she leaves out almost every letter celebrating cinema. Whereas she does include almost every single mention, at least it seems to me, of Dante. <laughs> <coughs> now, admittedly, none of us see things as they really are. We see things as we are. We all look through the lenses of our own interests. Whereas Reynolds assess Sayers through a medieval Italian lens, I look through the lens of something that was first marketed the year Sayers was born. In fact, you could almost say that cinema and Sayers were born the same year, 1893. Um, I'm sure you've seen pictures of this before. William Dixon, who was the assistant to Thomas Edison, uh, first marketed his kinetoscope, which was like a peep box. You would turn a, a handle and watch a continuous loop of moving images. Well, then he had to build a studio in order to create these moving images. And his studio was called the Black Maria. And again, the year that um, Sayers was born. You see down here, there's kind of a track. So this shed, basically, with this retractable roof, they would turn it to as the sun moved across the sky so you could capture the light shining in on what you wanted to film. Um, <clears throat> I then am turning Sayers' scholarship to capture the light from a different direction. And I begin, as did cinema, with celluloid, which was the substance that allowed Sayers' parents to photograph their only child. Uh, Dorothy loved posing in front of cameras. This is a famous I image where she plays Athos from the Three Musketeers. Furthermore, she herself loved photography. She won a contest in photography before she went off to Oxford University. And even more significant is that camera work, uh, uh, I want to prove, fed her imagination even more so when the pictures moved. In an unfinished memoir, Sayers mentions seeing a magic lantern show. Uh, and here is, there's a lot of different designs of magic lanterns, but every single film history book you read will talk about magic lantern as a parent of cinema. So Sears discusses being, um, going to a birthday party when she was about three or four years old, where there was a magic lantern show. And here's how she described it. The host projected a picture of a clown falling off a donkey. And she writes, I was frightened and had to be ignominiously taken out, qualifying her fright by saying in the exact same paragraph, I always had robust taste for literary horrors, pleading for the most murderous tales of ogres. In other words, she found projected moving images more psychologically powerful than spoken or written terrors. Sayers abandoned her memoir a month after beginning it, only to include some of the incidents, in, um, including the, the Magic Lantern show in a fictionalized biography called Catamary, which includes another antecedent of cinema, the zoetrope. Encountering it as a child, she describes it as well as any film scholar has ever described it. It was like a great metal bowl, she writes, with slits in the dial. You put in a sheet of colored pictures around the inside, and you gave the bowl a twirl on its stem. And then, when the bowl revolved, you looked through the slits and saw the pictures moving. It shouldn't surprise us, then, that during her years at Oxford University, Sayers took advantage of the town's six cinemas. And it took me a while to get that figure. But in, she went off to University 1912. There were six cinemas already at Oxford. 
And she would write home regaling her parents with what she saw on the screen, the Italian quo vetus, and the French three musketeers, which she could relate to. It is therefore all but certain, I believe, that Sayers screened as well the first international blockbuster in history, the Italian L'Inferno. This would explain why Sayers describes Dante's Inferno decades later with, we see the whole action as though it were shown on a screen. In 1947, she went so far as to suggest that Dante would consider film technique the best kind of form nowadays to recount the Divine Comedy. Why has nobody talked about this? L'Inferno may have influenced Sayer's first detective novel. Twice while she was a student at Oxford University, Punch Magazine alluded to the popular film. Long acquainted with the magazine, Sayers compared one of her Oxford experiences to a page out of Punch. So she more than likely saw the cartoons, both of which juxtapose posters of contemporary murders. So here you get it, murder, and see here's the poster for L'Inferno. The next one here is a, whoops, <clears throat> someone accosting someone else. And then there is what Sayers would later call the greatest image in the whole inferno, and it's probably better shown how DeRay um, imaged it with uh, peoples frozen up to the um, necks in ice. These punch cartoons then align 20th century murders with Dante as Sayers would do in her first novel called Whose Body, where amateur sleuth, Lord Peter Whimsey, and this is a pretty accurate representation of um, how he, in her mind, he would have looked. Um, he is on his way to purchase a Dante folio before he has to solve a murder. Even as his but butler, Bunter, excels as, at photography. Sayers continued to frequent movie theaters after graduating college. Her first job teaching high school French took her to the northern city of Hull, which though ugly and dreadfully dirty, as she put it, was <gasps> full of cinemas, yay. In 1916, after screening Kiberia uh, in Hull, Sayers exuberantly described it as glorious and magnificent, telling her parents, if you hear of it coming to Cambridge or, or anywhere, you ought to go and see it. I therefore want to show, and this is, will be my only clip from a film, because it's so interesting. This is a scene. This is Moloch, the god Moloch. And um, Sayers describes this scene. She says, um, there were lovely scenes, lovely, that's her word, lovely scenes of people being sacrificed to Moloch. <laughs> okay, now since the idea of human sacrifice is somewhat less than lovely, Sayers was clearly thinking of the medium itself, of its lovely camera work. And that is an assessment that is shared by most film scholars who note that Kiberia is um, the movie in which we have the first um, dolly shot in history. Before this, you would have you know, panning. So the camera would be stationary, but it might swivel back and forth, which is called a pan, or it might tilt up and down. But in Kiberia, Pastrone is the first person to put the camera on rollers and move the camera into the action. So this was something quite exciting to see. And so Elaine can, let's see, I'll. And watch the lovely sacrifice of children to Moloch.
this as you go through this mouth to enter the temple to Allah. Thank you. <clears throat> Meanwhile, despite the many cinemas, Sayers didn't relish teaching at Hull, so she moved back to Oxford for an unpaid internship at Blackwell's publishing firm, which meant that her father was once again having to support her. Nevertheless, she expended both time and money to travel from Oxford to London to have her picture taken by a professional justifying this uh, expenditure, expenditure to her mother with, Oxford is perfectly useless for photographs. <laughs> Significantly, she chose the Regent Street studio of 25-year-old photographer Dorothy Wilding, proclaiming to her mother that this woman was an artist. Okay, this woman had just opened her studio. Somehow Sayers got word of it. <clears throat> Dorothy Wilding, it, if any of you have seen the fantastic Netflix series, The Crown, about Queen Elizabeth, most of the images in The Crown and how the royal family looks and the mise-en-scene is based on Dorothy Wilding's photographs. She became famous for photographing the royal family. Sayers recognized artistry um, right, uh, right away. I became intrigued by this connection between two yet-to-be-famous Dorothys, both born the exact same year, and proceeded to read Wilding's memoir, which though never mentioning Sayers, makes clear that hanging on the wall of her Regent Street studio when Sayers came for her sitting was an image of Basil Rathbone, whom Wilding had posed in a top hat, cape, and monocle. This is as close as I could get. I couldn't find Wilding's photograph. Uh, but this is very similar to the way Sayers presents Lord Peter Whimsey in her first novel several years later. And an added irony coincidence is the fact that Basil Rathbone, as some of you may know, became famous for playing Sherlock Holmes in 14 movies. Sherlock Holmes, who Sayers mentions in almost every novel that she writes. <clears throat> Not long after Wilding's uh, studio picture, Sayers moved to Normandy to help a love interest run a boarding school, saying, and here's the, that's her passport photo, and then here's the love interest, saying of their flirtatious relationship, it would make rather a jolly movie one of these days. <laughs> During her year in France, she started writing screenplays, and she loved it. She thought she found her career. And the trouble is, being in France in 1920 wasn't the place to be if you wanted to make a career in um, cinema. So she actually turned to detective fiction, not because she liked it, because, but she needed the money. As she told her mother, well, that's where the money is. Moving to London after her year in France, she continued to go to the movies. When accidentally locked out of her flat in 1924, she passed the time looking at the first film adaptation of Peter Pan. Uh, in 1926, she married a man who also loved movies, perhaps explaining why they didn't mind when they um, moved to the London suburbs, they moved into a house next door to a cinema. Sayers made um, two famous movies key to a short story entitled Image in the Mirror. And I'm going to go quickly over this. Uh, the Student of Prague, she made uh, mentions. And it's basically 
a retelling of the Faust legend. And when the movie was remade in 1926, the German was actually Faust. Those of you who know about Dorothy Sayers, she wrote her own Faust uh, play, The Devil to Pay. So you just wonder if that might have suggested something. The other movie she mentions is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, one of the, the um, most famous movies in the history of film, which happens to be the image that was chosen to be the cover of this book. So Sayers loved the crooked walls, just the love, the artistry of what is known as German Expressionism. <clears throat> Okay. Sayers finally had a chance to enter filmmaking herself. She was invited to write a short story about Lord Peter Whimsey for um, a company called Phoenix Films. And she was told to uh, go see another one of their movies to see if one of the minor actors would make a good Lord Peter Whimsey. To make a long story short, uh, when she, she wrote the, the story and friended Peter Haddon, who played Lord Peter, but when she got the shooting script, it was so bad that she was just appalled with it. And she said that she would be um, willing at financial loss to herself to rewrite the screenplay. She didn't want her name associated with anything that bad. And to show you how bad it was, um, here is the poster for it. That's supposed to be Lord Peter at the top, who in none of the fiction ever holds a gun. I mean, it was just, they were just using um, Sayre's celebrity. And it uh, it rankled her. In fact, the director of the film, Reginald Denham, acknowledges the shoddiness of his work, saying, between 1933 and 1939, I directed no less than 24 pi pictures. And weren't they awful? <laughs> he even mentions the silent passenger, complaining that Sayers blue penciled the script with patronizing marginal notes becoming rather more than tiresome. Um, and he attributed the problem to the fact that she had a passion for Lord Peter Whimsey. But what he didn't realize is that she had a passion, what she called the passion of making, the integrity of work. So, um, Biographers have in concluded, therefore, she never more had anything more to do with films. This is inaccurate. Um, part of her negative response that she starts writing about is in Murder Must Advertise is actually talkies. And she um, derogates talkies. But she was doing that no differently than other cultural theorists of her day were because the trouble with talkies, so I have another show and tell, is they were like containers, but they were containers of things just to consume, like old potato chips. And in this case, rather than pulling out insights, it was all about what money you could pull out of um, a film, you know, trying to get as many people there as possible. <clears throat> so, uh, this experience at Phoenix Films and then her criticism of talkies leads to one of my most exciting discoveries at the Wade, where um, one of the people who criticizes talkies is Michael Powell. I'm going to skip forward here. He is considered one of the greatest British filmmakers 
probably after Alfred Hitchcock, but then of course Hitchcock left and went to Hollywood. Michael Powell was committed to the power of the medium and uh, created fantastic films. And I discovered in our holdings a letter from Michael Powell to Dorothy Sayers. This is 1947 and the fact she had lunch with him. I mean, this is big. Michael Powell was the mentor of Martin Scorsese and um, Coppola. So not only did they have lunch, and he's talking about that, but she was willing to talk to him in 1947 about the adaptation of um, several of her novels into films. I want to close talking about the most important part of my research. And that is that I believe that Sayre's frustration with Phoenix Films and the shoddy work actually helped transform the focus of her career, forcing her <clears throat> to take her faith off a shelf that she put it on, starting in adolescence. I mean, she never lost her faith, but she kind of put it on, on a shelf, dusted it off when necessary. But it wasn't an essential part of who she, she was. But one year after the premiere of Silent Passenger, this, which she even refused to see, she was invited to write a play for the yearly Canterbury Festival, which was held in the cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral, which was a, uh, supposed to be about history of the cathedral. And she chose as the protagonist of this play an architect who, as one character puts it, thinks of nothing, lives for nothing, but the integrity of his work. Then, around the 100th performance of Zeal, which was um, a great success, Sayers composed an essay for BFI's Sight and Sound magazine. This is the preeminent journal um, of cinema in the English language. Her essay was called Detective Stories for the Screen and was clearly inspired by her Phoenix fiasco. The article discusses film adaptations of print stories, arguing that filmmakers must trust the original writer to know his own job. A clear echo of words she gave to the architect in her um, play for Canterbury Cathedral, which was called Zeal of the House, where the architect says, allow me to know my own job. There seems to be a connection there. Furthermore, by having to place her play in a cathedral, Sayers was forced to think about the theological implications of the integrity of work. For this play that was performed in celebration of the God who these towers point to. And she ends the play with an angel proclaiming that humans <laughs> that humans manifest the image of God, or in Latin, the Imago Dei, through creativity, through the integrity of their creativity. And the Imago Dei is based on this verse in Genesis 1, so God created humankind in his image, in the image of God he created them. This then provided Sayers with a theological response to the Phoenix fiasco. The Imago Dei had been suppressed and degraded by insouciant filmmakers. Sayers had finally found her vocation. Lord, while Lord Peter Wimsey was explicitly non-religious, almost all of Sayers' work to follow the zeal of the house, her Canterbury play, focused on biblical and or theological issues. In 1940, she agreed to write a cycle of plays about Jesus for the Children's Hour on BBC Radio. Um, and interestingly, when an associate director wanted her to cut elements from the first play, 
Sayers justified the complexity of her script by arguing, quote, cinema had made children far more sophisticated than we ever were at their age. 11 days before the first play was to be broadcast, Sayers read snippets from one of her plays, and this generated a nationwide scandal because not only did Sayers not use King James English, she had the disciples speaking slang, and horror of horror, she used the language of Hollywood. Protests were set, of a letter writing campaign. As Christians demanded that these plays be taken off the air, that they be censored. Um, and Sayers refused to back down using the same language that she um, developed in the midst of the Phoenix fiasco. It's about the integrity of my work. God, once again, works in mysterious ways. Due to the press-generated scandal, many people who had never listened to Christian radio broadcasts before tuned in just to hear what all the fuss was about. And what they heard was the gospel message in language they could understand. As Sayers told C.S. Lewis, quote, thousands of people write me to say that they have been brought back to God or had their faith renewed or returned with eagerness to reading the Bible due to the language of Hollywood. Lewis himself read a print version of the radio plays every year for his Easter week devotions till he died. In sum, I am suggesting that Sayer's fiery encounter with Phoenix Films generated in her a goal like the one she expressed in Zeal of Thy House, to raise up, whoops, to raise up beauty from ashes. One could only wonder if Sayers felt a bit of warmth several years later as she translated the following line from Dante's Inferno. The phoenix dies and is reborn from fire. Thanks. We'll take questions. Since we're recording, uh, please wait till you get the microphone to ask the question. I forgot part of my introduction. Crystal's book on Dorothy Sayers writing performances uh, not only won the Clytus uh, Kilby grant here at the Wade Center, but also the Barbara Reynolds Award uh, at, from the Dorothy Sayers Society. And that we flew over to Cambridge to receive the award, and Barbara Reynolds herself presented it. She asked Crystal to sign a copy of the book. And Crystal was taking a while to come up with an inscription. And Barbara Reynolds said, she has such a fertile mind, I believe she's adding a new chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was <laughs> uh, Questions, comments? Thank you very much. That was wonderful. So we often think in terms of low culture and high culture. Mm. Sometimes detective fiction is considered genre literature and not like high literature. Mm -hmm. Did she use those categories? And if so, did she think cinema was one or the other? Well, she had these debates with someone in, in, called Kathleen Knott, who had written a book called The Emperor's Clothes, which was disparaging um, all these Christians who write uh, best-selling fiction. So she definitely was aware of that tension. In fact, Kathleen Knott in her book said, um, she indicted T.S. Eliot as well, and she says, but she's not, he's not as bad as those tub thumpers for the faith like Dorothy Sayers and C.S. Lewis. So she was very aware, she knew about I.A. Richards and um, this, mystification of culture, which is pronounced that way, versus popular culture, which is like the moo of a cow, culture. Yeah. Uh, 
I loved your very uh, sneaky approach to using Derrida for yeah. <laughs> uh, bringing in the, the message of uh, the gospel. Um, and there was an interesting connection in your reference to Kabiria and the, the Moloch scene because um, Derrida is very fascinated in the gift of death uh, with the story of Abraham and Isaac uh -huh. and the fact that he, he says that it's the ultimate demonstration of duty to sacrifice unto death mm -hmm. uh, what you believe. Mm -hmm. And um, I just see that connection really fascinating. Yeah. Um, how does Derrida factor in any, can you say anything else about maybe how the Christian message in, in the work that you're doing uh, sneaks in? Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Derrida, as many of you know, is considered for what is known as the religious turn in philosophy because he was calling into question this enlightenment dismissal of faith that, oh, well, we who are uh, um, aware of science know that truth can only be those things that are empirically verifiable. In fact, I.A. Richards was this way as well. He said um, that uh, the language of poetry is pseudo-language, that it can save our souls. So the idea that culture, science gives us truth, culture gives us meaning. And Derrida um, came along and said that's ridiculous. That's as much a faith position as um, someone who uh, practices a religion. And so Derrida was talking about, he. Um, repeatedly made reference to the idea of the possibility of the impossible. And slowly he started substituting the name of God for the word impossible. So he was talking about the possibility of God. So he was willing to even deconstruct his own atheism, aware that that atheism is a faith position. And so what he and other postmodern theorists did is put Christians on par with scientists because they, are as much, they have as much faith in reason as a Christian has faith in God. And actually, um, Sayers talks about that as well, that you have to believe in reason if you're even going to be someone who is an advocate of a scientific um, explanation for reality. David. I like the t subtitle of your book, Medium is the Message. Um, oh. Just curi out of curiosity, any connection with uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan? Oh, yeah. I talk about Marshall McLuhan, and this is interesting. Uh, at a conference, which was about Derrida, they were discussing Marshall McLuhan's famous uh, statement, the medium is the message, and somebody said, well, that's a fundamentally Christian position. And Marshall McLuhan was a Roman Catholic. And so uh, these people understood what Christianity meant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're the lucky next questioner. Good. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I, it is so amazing that you are here because there are so many faculty and student interests that converge around the talk that you gave today oh, and just good. wonderfully reach, taking these figures and reaching out to all these different interests that people have. So I'm, I'm just dazzled by this. This is the best lecture on cinema I have ever seen. So, so I, I want to thank you, and I guess I, I, I get, having said that, I do have you know a little pushback. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> You're buttering me up, right? right. Well, I mean, I was just imagining someone thinking this, like, "Hey, it's really bad to sacrifice children." Um, does film mm. not just take, uh, for example, an affair or sin, mm -hmm. gloss it up? I mean, she clearly would uh, be aware of that. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to someone who says, hey, um, what happens when, when film, um, this beauty in the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. leads to sin, right? Mm -hmm. It's a delightful to the eyes. What would Dorothy say about that? What would you say about mm -hmm. that? Yeah. 
what in the book I'm working on right now, I compare um, Sayre's view of this, and she actually talks about uh, Hitler and uh, portrayals of Hitler and uh, how this is an ugly subject matter, but it can be presented in a way that provides um, theological significance. And Susan Sontag was interesting because she would proclaim the, the beauties of films by um, Lenny Reisens, how do you pronounce that? Reisenstahl. Yeah, Reisenstahl, who um, was a Nazi filmmaker. And even though the content was abhorrent, that Susan Sontag, who herself was Jewish, could say, I recognize that she has artist, artistry here. Now this got Sayers into problems because the Imago Dei, and as many of you know in this room, it is even more complex for her because not only is creativity fulfilling the Imago Dei, but she says that cre creativity is Trinitarian. So that anybody who is creative has felt the, the Trinitarian components of creation. But then some people said, yeah, but what about despicable people who are very creative? And you think of someone like a Picasso who's pretty despicable. Um, so that, yeah, that is, a, that is a hard one and my advice to people, especially when they see, go to films, they should read up as much as they can about them to figure out if this is something that I want to submit my imagination to or if this is something that I want to avoid. Isn't Kabiria judging them for sacrificing their well, yeah, children? it's presenting so, right. the idea of sin. So, so yeah. De yeah, depicting sin I mean, you can still have a redemptive moment at the end. There is a fantastic film. One of my favorite filmmakers is a Polish woman named Agnieszka Holland who had a Jewish father and a Roman Catholic mother. So she makes these fantastic films about the Holocaust in World War II because she has these two halves of herself and she just shows um, despicable activities of Nazis, but then moments of redemption um, through that. Can I throw in a tangent? Yeah. On child sacrifice, uh, we had a colleague at Messiah College in Old Testament who said, you look at child sacrifice and you say the brutality, the, the unfeeling, the callousness of it. And he says, it's just the opposite. These are Isaacs bringing their child to be sacrificed and there's no angel to stay their hand. He mm. says, this just shows their desperation. Life is so difficult, so out of control. They were saying, what do we have to do to appease these gods? So he thought, if anything, that kind of activity should evoke your profoundest pity rather than yeah. your judgment. Well, and it's a classic example of the economy of exchange. Yeah. So that you have to sacrifice your child to get your salvation. And that's why uh, we as Christians have to avoid in our language as much as possible using exchangeous language because as soon as we do so, we reduce Christianity to operating like all other religions. Crystal, thanks. That was wonderful. Uh, could I just ask one question? The Michael Powell document really interested me. Yeah. And so, uh, do, you, do you know what came of that or the, the exchange? I assume that's the only letter that the Wade has of Dorothy <laughs> Sayers communicating with Michael Powell. Do you have any sense of where their dialogue w ever went beyond that? Or is that something that's lost to, lost to the ages? <coughs> yeah something that's lost. And of course, I haven't read every unpublished uh, document in uh, the Wade's vaults. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope that someday I can, but nothing, obviously, we have no evidence of an adaptation of Murder Must Advertise or Nine Tailors. Interestingly enough, some people would say, oh, Sayers loved theater and she poo-pooed film. But I, there's actually one unpublished letter 
where she said, um, someone wants to make um, a theater piece out of nine tailors. She said it would make a much better film. So she was aware, and um, I'm ha gonna have to go back and look at that date to see if it's after she talked, had lunch with Michael Powell. <coughs> yes, Chris. Precisely, but I'm just thinking um, the, the, the rise of fundamentalism in Christianity in the United States. <coughs> um, these British artists, writers like C.S. Lewis and Sayer seem to have a much more complex understanding of the role of art. And did that really cross over the ocean or not so much? Was there much dialogue about these kind of things in the U.S.? Did Americans have that appreciation or not so much? Maybe, do you want to talk about Lewis? I was gonna say they sent emissaries to the US to try to make them more culturally sophisticated and they all sunk on the Titanic. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a whole generation there that didn't get it with art and. Economy of exchange, there you go. Oh, yeah. Well, I think you're right that the Anglicans, in some ways, you didn't have the same dynamic among Christian Anglicans and Catholics in England that you had in America. People don't realize how distinctively American that movement is. When I was growing up, I thought all Christians were fundamentalists. I didn't realize there was a lot more diversity. Um, in terms of Lewis, I think part of the reason he became so important to the next generation, World War II and after, is because they were grasping for more elegant answers to theology, to ethics, to the relationship between beauty and faith. And he, he and Chesterton and Sayers and that whole group that we celebrate here at the Wade, they were able to give people a much broader understanding of these issues than we'd gotten uh, growing up in our churches and our own families. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that's the justification for the existence of the Wade, that these were Christians who stood out at the height of modernist resistance to Christianity and uh, were not back backing down, but because of their Anglo-Catholic sensibilities, there is a far greater responsiveness to the visual. I know that uh, we still have inherited from Puritans this abhorrence of um, images. You can still go to parts of England where you can see little churches where during the um, interregnum, Puritans, or the Civil War that led to the interregnum, where Puritans came in and just um, whitewashed all the frescoes out of the churches because that is idolatrous to have images in a church. So there was that element in, within England, but I think because it was associated with a, um, a political regime that didn't last very long, there was a resistance to that, that level of iconoclasm. Lewis never caught Sayers' enthusiasm for a film. He, the only ones he saw were King Kong and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. There's always a fantasy element. Uh, but he said that he thought that films were noisy, busy, unrestful to the eye. And he said, the only reason people go is because the theaters are warmer than their own flats in London. <laughs> so he did not share her enthusiasm for a film. So I just wanted to go back to a point you were making earlier. Um, I actually saw an interview with um, I, um, Steven Spielberg, and he was talking about Schindler's List, which is obvious a very difficult subject matter. Mm -hmm. And he did a masterful job at that. And I thought it was very interesting that it, I just remember this when you were talking about uh, the craft of the film, the art of it. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked him, you know, if he had a favorite scene or if what did he think about the film itself. And he said, one of it, this is very interesting, the night of the broken glass, the crystal knock, where they mm -hmm. went in to liquidate the Jewish ghettos, this, the film, the scene where the German soldiers playing Bach on the piano and the lighting wow. of the machine guns, he said that was his favorite. Mm -hmm. He's not talking about the actual subject. He's talking about the craft of the film. Mm -hmm. So that I think that reinforces mm -hmm. your point. I think mm -hmm. maybe Sayer's point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yes, gentlemen. Did uh, Dorothy Sayers think she'd accomplish something different or better with the Busman honeymoon as a drama than she had with the novels or even with the, oh. the story when it became a novel? Um, I'm rusty on that. I can tell you that there are numerous references to cinema in Busman's 
honeymoon, and she compares Lord Peter Wimsey to a, a famous film star of the time, Ralph Lynn. Uh, but I don't know. Marge, do you remember if she preferred? The thing is, Sayers, let me put it this way. Sorry to interrupt, <laughs> Marge. Sayers was very aware of the medium itself. So she was aware that theater is a different medium than cinema. And this was the difficulty for her. When you take a novel and put it on the screen, you have to change it. Otherwise, it's not going to be a good work of art unless you change it. But all of us have had that experience, I'm sure, where we've seen a film made out of one of our favorite novels, and we just go, oh, it's not as good as the book, right? But if they tried to duplicate everything in the book, it would be a rotten film. It's a different medium. So this awareness of the medium even goes along with this theater versus novel form or film versus theater. And it would be a very long film, too. It would oh, be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you made a, a good case for Sayers' uh, youthful love of film and as a young adult, the importance to her. And maybe I'm wrong, but you kind of implied that when sound came in, it, it uh, mm -hmm. she was dubious about it. Right? What did she keep this love of film uh, into her, to the end of her life and her later adulthood? Uh, do you find examples in her letters of films that she just loved personally or important to her? And if so, what were some of the later films that she really yeah. admired? Yeah. You don't see as many references later on. Part of it, she became, after The Zeal of Thy House, uh, she became incredibly busy. She was asked to speak and write. Uh, she actually had to make it in her house where she would put a different writing project in each room so that uh -huh. she could change her mental sensibilities. Oh yeah, okay, here's where I'm working on this essay and then go out here. Okay, here's where I'm working on um, this particular talk. Here's where I'm working on Bucky uh, Honeymoon, which of course was made into a film too. I, haven't, I didn't have time to mention that. But I haven't seen in her letters references but that may be have been because she was so busy, and it may be because she was so discouraged at the poor quality of talkies that she, she gave up on film. And once again, she was just agreeing with all the film scholars around. That as late as 1957, Rudolf Arnheim, and 57 is the year she died, Rudolf Arnheim said that um, cinema reached its artistic heights in the late silent period. Yeah. Now, that was 57, and then right after that is where you get um, the French New Wave, where there was a return to this French interest in the artistry of film. We have time for one more question. <coughs> To end on a very light note, do you have a favorite film representation of Lord Peter Whimsey? <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The picture I showed you was from a series, for, I think from the 1980s, and that captured his look better. But that's all I can say. And on that note, thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Downing, for sharing with us.